Hi folks, uh, the Moravian passage today is Matthew chapter 19 verses 23 through to 30. And I want to frame my thoughts about this passage around a simple idea that actually how we live with or without riches is critical in the kingdom of God. Now Jesus starts by giving this well-known passage about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he uses the metaphor or the analogy of it's, it's, it's harder than for an, a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And he's literally talking about, you know, a tiny, tiny little hole through the top of a needle. In other words, he's exaggerating, it's hyperbole, but he's trying to make a point. It's really, really difficult. Why is it so difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, the problem with riches is they are seductive. They draw us into a kind of idolatry. We become dependent on needing more. It's almost like an addiction. There was a survey done some years ago about how much extra money on top of what you currently earn or have it would take for someone to be happy. And the interesting thing was, on average, Whatever the income bracket, whether they were you know, quite poor or whether they were very well off, most people said all it would require for them to be happy would to be have an extra 20% on their current income, which exposes the lie, doesn't it, that actually money could even buy happiness or contentment. Of course, it can't. We know that. And yet something within us yearns for more, We either more security or more access to opportunity or more material goods whatever it is that money gains for us we want more of it because it is a seducer money finance riches wealth are seductive and they grip our hearts that's why the second part of this passage is so important because it's all about giving up those riches and of course, Jesus says it is possible for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven, but it's really, really hard for the reasons I've said. But the, the secret to live with riches is actually giving them away. I'm not talking about giving up all of your worldly possessions and living in a cave somewhere. I'm talking about that radical generosity that characterizes the kingdom of God. And of course, the more wealth we have, the greater responsibility we have, perhaps the more difficult choices we have to be generous with those riches. But Jesus goes on to say, uh, in answer to Peter's question, when Peter says, but, but Lord, we, we've done all this. We've, we've given you everything. You know, we've, we've, we've sacrificed everything for the sake of your kingdom. He says, we've given up everything and followed you. What, what, what will there be for us, he says? It's, it's a good question, isn't it? Sometimes we feel like we've got nothing else to give and, you know, what have we got to show for it? But here's the promise, and I want us to hang on to this promise today. Uh, Jesus says, uh, not only in the life to come, in the restoration of all things, he uses the word regeneration here, it's in the future age that you will have responsibility in the kingdom, there'll be blessing, there'll be rewards, but he says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children's or farms, which represents the, the more material aspects of things we sacrifice, for my sake will receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. Now, when you cross-reference this with the passage in Mark, which is exactly the same uh, moment when Jesus is giving this teaching, Mark adds a little bit extra. He says that uh, not only that you will receive not just many times as much, but a hundred times as much. This is Mark 10, verses 29 to 30. A hundred times as much. And he specifies in this present age and in the age to come, eternal life. So do we give in order to be blessed? No, of course not. We give because it's blessed to be a blessing and it's blessed to be generous. And our hearts are freed from the seductive power of mammon when we do that. I remember when 
Jenny and I sold a house and gave half of the equity away many, many years ago. How liberating that was for us. It was amazing. We, we, we skipped all the way back from the offering bucket in which we put our offering in. And we just felt so free from the power of mammon. Generosity sets us free from that. But it also is investing both for this life and the future life. How does it invest for this life? Well, partly you can't outgive God and he just wants to keep giving back to you. And when we moved to Liverpool, God gave us a house the size of the one that we'd sold to, to make the offering. Uh, by moving to Liverpool, that became possible. And it was an amazing blessing to us. But also, as we are generous with the family of God around us, guess what? Those investments, they keep rolling back because as we create this family culture of generosity and sharing, like the early church did in Acts 2, where they shared all of their possessions, they had everything in common, you suddenly find you actually own all of the stuff of the whole community. You have access to it all. It's homes, it's brothers and sisters, it's mothers and fathers, it's homes, it's, it's everything where you have sacrificed your time, your energy and your money and your home. It's given back to you many, many times over because you have access to all of that in the extended family in which you have been investing. And that's irrespective of anything that God drops through your letterbox or blesses you in any very physical, personal and obvious way financially. That's on top of any of that. So be encouraged, be blessed today, that uh, don't hang on to your riches, use them to be generous, break the power of mammon in your life, sow into the family of God, and let that generosity rebound to you by being part of an amazingly rich family in which you will be blessed. God bless you.